Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are located now, in what part of the world. Uh, the Riga conference has different type of panels, and this time we have an online panel which is organized jointly with the Boston Global Forum. And we have several distinguished speakers and members of the Boston Global Forum. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is related to the question of multilateralism. What is the role of multilateralism in the 21st century and particularly after, uh, after the 24th of February when um, a war uh, was, uh, was, was taking place in Ukraine and the United Nations and other international organizations were very slow to respond uh, to this military aggression. And uh, indeed, looking at what decisions are taken in the United Nations, how countries position themselves, we cannot celebrate uh, these days the glory of multilateralism, just opposite. There is a lot of criticism going on with regard international organizations and multinational activities. The Boston Global Forum came up with a proposal to talk about a new type of multilateral framework which could consist of four uh, major players, the United States, the European Union, Japan and India. Uh, and indeed, to a very large extent, uh, this type of multilateral framework uh, corresponds to ideas of new Security Council, which was um, never even <laughs> attempted uh, to, 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 to be reformed within the United Nations. But indeed, these are major players in international, uh, international relations. And and if we are talking about different types of threats and risks taking place around us, then leadership is needed, leadership in terms of um, economic uh, power, in terms of diplomatic power, but also in terms of military power, because as we can see right now, it's not only a matter of uh, just hybrid, cyber, or whatever attacks. It's, three, it's still uh, all day military threats are present in our international uh, system. So therefore, we need ideas, uh, we need solutions, we need political debates which could lead to peace and security, stability in the world. Therefore, we have just uh, extremely uh, tight and extremely uh, important agenda, which we have to address only in one hour time. And I'm sorry for that, but this is the format of Ausriga conference. So we just put our ideas on the table and we try at least to address very urgent issues, which we will elaborate and, and we will work on later on when the conference will be over. I would like to start giving floor to Michael Dukakis, who is the president of the Boston Global Forum and founder of this forum, also governor of Massachusetts for very many uh, years and just came from, from Boston. Boston and, and really your legacy is very much seed there. Uh, Michael Dukakis, please, uh, could you explain really in a very few minutes what is the concept of this new multilateral framework, what you and your colleagues are trying to propose? So what is the essence? Please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much and thanks to all of you for being a part of this. Uh, oh, I'm coming through. Am I? You're hearing? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I'll try to be brief because we don't have much time. But uh, I am a huge believer in multilateralism, which is a fancy word for what? For people coming together who want to solve problems. And uh, we've got a clear opportunity here and, a re and responsibility, it seems to me, to try to do that in the face of what's been happening over the past several months. Uh, I'll leave details to many of you, because I'm interested in listening today primarily, but I think it is so important that we bring the international community together in as effective a way as we possibly can. And I would include China as part of that community. Feel free 
to disagree with, but I don't see how we can proceed with this in a serious way if we essentially ignore the Chinese. They're important, they're powerful, they're having their problems these days, who isn't? But uh, I think it's a mistake to ignore them or not to attempt to work closely with them because of who they are and secondly because at least when it comes to the most important issue in many ways that we have to deal with and that is the future of the planet the Chinese seem to be very interested in doing that now they've got their problems with Russia you may or may not want to discuss that but uh, I think this is an opportunity an opportunity to engage the entire international community, including China. And I'd be interested very much in your thoughts about that, because uh, I, I think they're inclined to collaborate with us, uh, and particularly in the face of what has been going on in Russia and uh, all of that which many of us have had to deal with. So um, I offer that as one serious suggestion, along with the general notion of dealing with this in a multilateral way. Uh, we're very interested in that. Uh, we want very much to work with all of you on it. And uh, I hope as a result of this discussion and others that we begin to move in a constructive way. And uh, it seems to me that that should include China along with international community generally uh, and obviously i am you would be very much interested in your thoughts on that in any event a pleasure to be with you uh, thank you so much for engaging us and involving us and we look forward to working with you Thank you very much, Governor. Indeed, uh, you reminded uh, also about uh, potential threat of uh, China. And if we're looking at the most recent uh, strategic concept of NATO, it quite, quite clearly also indicates that there are uh, two major threats uh, which countries are facing. One is uh, Russia, which is very obvious aggressor in Ukraine, but also China cannot be neglected neglected because of very many different reasons. So therefore, it's not a surprise that we are having with us Yasuhide Nakayama uh, from Japan, and he is coordinator of the Global Alliance for Digital Governance for Japan and Taiwan. So uh, how do you see this new multilateral framework of four countries contributing to stability in your region? Please, floor is yours. Uh, good evening from Japan. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, thank you very much. And uh, it, it is very honored to be invited here and join the discussion. So thank you very much at the beginning. Uh, I think the security environment uh, surrounding Japan is becoming increasingly severe. Uh, in particular, the risk in, risks in, tai, in the Taiwan Strait are more real than when senior U.S. military officials testified, testified uh, before Congress last year. Uh, you can understand it from Mr. Blinken's remarks a few days ago. And also, China Communist Party Congress and President Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping uh, secures an, an unusual third term, he become more possibility to aggressive towards uh, the, the neighbors. In July of this year, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was killed by an assassin's bullet and sent to heaven. Uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and I talked about the significance of the G20 Osaka summit on June 28th and 29th, 2019. Before Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was killed, uh, it is the decision to develop and build advanced infrastructure in areas geopolitically included in the free and open Indo-Pacific vision. In particular, this means not allowing any state 
to change the status quo by force. At the same time, we will not allow countries that build infrastructure to set up debt traps. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe told me that the significance of the G20 Osaka summit is that all the all G20 countries, including China, have reached an agreement that includes these implications. I also think that free open in the Pacific is facilitating new frameworks such as Quad, Quad, and existing multilateral partnerships and bilateral relations. In the future, our relationship with India uh, will be particularly important. I would like to explain some of the diplomatic efforts uh, Japan is making towards India. Um, uh, background I'd like to talk about, India has become more worried uh, of China after the 2020 deadly, deadly uh, clashes in the under, un, undetermined China-India border region, uh, which led to the first death in 45 years. Uh, partly because of such circumstances, India is more actively participating in the frameworks led by Western countries, including Japan, the United States, Australia, and India it itself. At the same time, India has a historical background that began during the Cold War, and India maintains friendly relations, relations with Russia. In particular, India, can, India continues to rely heavy, heavily on Russia's, Russia for military equipment, and at times it, it has shown moves rooted in traditional balanced diplomacy such as abstaining from voting on United Nations re resolution concerning the situation in Ukraine. Efforts to attract India from Japan, which is about to emerge as a regional power in South Asia and as a global power to the side of Japan. Japan and the de democracy are also important for the realization of a free and open Indo-Pacific. I recognize that. Uh, there is. And efforts continue building trust between leaders uh, through annual uh, reciprocal visits. In March 2020, Prime Minister Kishida will visit India as the destination of his first bilateral overseas visit since his in inauguration, uh, resuming annual uh, mutual visit, visits between leaders, which has been Posed due to the COVID-19 crisis, while the foundation of the of the international order have been shaken by Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the joint statement state, state, states states that all states will seek peace in the dispute in accordance with international law, without uh, res resorting to the threat to the threat or use of force or unilateral attempts to change the status quo uh, under, underscored the need to pursue a holistic solution and re, re, reaffirmed our uh, shared vision for a non-coercive free, free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, quantitative and quanti qua qualitative uh, expansion of bilateral security and the defense cooperation, including Japan, US, Australia, India, joint, ma joint maritime exercises called Malabar, Japan, India joint exercise will be con conducted in all three military services. Between Japan and India, the defense equipment and the technology transfer agreement, the information protection agreement, and the ACSA, uh, acquisition and the process ser servicing agreement were concluded and entered into force. In September 2022, the second Japan-India Foreign and Defense Ministerial Meeting 2 plus 2 will be held at Tokyo. They agreed to continue discussions towards the realization of concrete cooperation in the field of defense equipment and the technology cooperation. It was confirmed that coordination will be advanced towards 
the launch of the uh, staff consultation, efforts to support India's economic development and incorporate its vitality into Japan. At the time of the Prime Minister's uh, visit to India in March 2022, uh, the, pub the public and the private sectors agreed to invest 5 trillion yen in India over the next five years. In recent years, India has become Japan's largest recipient of yen loans, support for high-speed railways, Delhi Metro, etc., providing approximately uh, 312.2 billion yen in uh, FY 2021. Uh, Concretize, con concretize Japan-India cooperation in third countries and in the north, northeastern north part of India as a cooperation for strengthening uh, connectivity, uh, achieving uh, concrete results through the Japan-US-Australia-India framework. In September 2021, the first face-to-face -face summit meeting in Washington, D.C. will be held, and in May 2022, a face-to-face -face summit meeting will be held in Japan. Uh, to date, working groups have been uh, launched in a wide range of fields, including vaccine, important uh, emerging technologies, climate <clears throat> and all, infrastructure space, and cyber, and, and, uh, per, per, <laughs> and the practical co cooperation has been promoted in wide range of fields. For example, in the Japan, U.S., Australia, India vaccine cooperation, Japan, the United States, Australia, and India jointly provided vaccines manufactured in India to Southeast Asian countries. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, you gave a very comprehensive picture of uh, different type of activities taking place between uh, Japan and India and also building other multilateral frameworks, including also Australia and the United States. Uh, and, and particularly the last examples you mentioned are of relevance to health safety of, of, of its citizens. And I will definitely come back to some of your points which you made, but now I would like to give floor to Mr. Sharad Sharma from India, who is co-founder of E-Spirit Forum, or I-Spirit Forum, and you just heard your colleagues from uh, Japan overview and quite optimistic picture of, of, of potential of such kind of multilateral framework, but at the same time, India is placed also in a challenging geopolitical uh, setting because uh, India's uh, good relations with Russia um, could have impact on building multilateralism uh, framework including US, EU, um, Japan and India uh, which would strive for peace and security and undermine uh, Russia's uh, interest uh, when it comes to its geopolitical picture of the world. World. Please, floor is yours. Thank you so much. I strongly echo the comments that uh, Honorable Nakayama uh, has made about India. And we share a common problem. I think an aggressive China is a very big threat to India. And uh, as was mentioned, we have border disputes and these have resulted in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in, uh, in people dying in, in military uh, people dying uh, at the borders, which had not happened, uh, you know, since 1962. So, uh, so this is a very big issue for India. India has uh, to restructure its economy to reduce its import dependence on China as well, and there are economic efforts underway to make that happen. Uh, so, so we share a common interest, uh, particularly with Japan, where there has been a long-standing uh, good relationship. And recently, the Quad, uh, which includes Australia and the US as well, has been also becoming more and more active. Uh, and I think this has relevance to the rest of the world because part of the trade route that everybody relies on beyond Taiwan Straits is the Duncan Passageway, which is next to uh, the Andaman uh, Islands. And uh, India is really focused on strengthening its naval presence there 
so that it can keep those trade routes open uh, despite uh, some kind of aggressive action by China. So, so this is, I think, the geopolitical situation on which there is a fair amount of alignment. Now, when we look at India, I think India is got to strengthen itself, uh, you know, to become a more meaningful player. And uh, and there have been many efforts underway in India. There is one that is to do with building digital infrastructure. Honorable Nakayama pointed out to the physical infrastructure related to roads, uh, related to metros, related to bullet trains, you know, where uh, we've benefited from uh, the both technology as well as capital that has been provided by, by Japan. Uh, but in the area of digital infrastructure, I think India has taken a leap. In the last 10 years, India has revamped uh, the way it manages the flow of people, money, and information uh, through its economy. It has done that through a public-private partnership uh, by co-opting uh, the market players in this exercise on the back of open platforms and open open protocols. And the results have been quite significant. Uh, you know, we have the largest digital identity system, which where privacy has been built in. Uh, we have uh, now one of the largest uh, uh, payment systems uh, in, in India, which is today doing more payments, more digital payments than China and uh, U.S. put together. Uh, we've we've off late been uh, making great progress on equipping or giving our citizens an ability to deal with personal data that fully secures their privacy as well as giving them the empowerment that they need to be able to get personalization from other companies as they go forward. So, <clears throat> so there th these uh, this is something that is now available. India is. Uh, making this kind of digital infrastructure, which, as I said, is founded on uh, on the principles of a public good, available uh, to other countries, and uh, many other countries have taken this on. France is is announced that they would be using our uh, fast payment system. Uh, there are nine countries that are using our digital identity system, and EU has uh, shown a lot of interest to launch our. DEPA, the data empowerment and protection architecture in Europe as GDPR2. So I would only suggest that as we look at this multilateral picture, amongst the many things that we are looking at, we do include uh, digital public infrastructure as one of the dimensions uh, in the conversation. Keeping in mind, <clears throat> since India takes on the G20 uh, presidency from December of this year for a, for a one-year period, uh, India has signaled in its September 13th press release about its focus areas. And one of the four focus areas for India is going to be digital public infrastructure. So I would only request as we look at this multilateral conversation, which is going to be very important in this new ge geopolitical world uh, that uh, Honorable Nakayama described so brilliantly, uh, I, we have a holistic approach we talk about security collaboration, especially cybersecurity, but we also talk about uh, about digital infrastructure as well. So, so thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting uh, to listen Indian perspective, and uh, now starting with Michael Dukakis and going to Japan's perspective, now India's perspective, uh, there are a lot of commonalities, but at the same time, there are two big pillars. Uh, this one pillar is domestic agenda, which is very much dominated by economic and uh, societal needs. So for obvious reasons, indeed, we are in a situation of post-COVID crisis. But on the other hand, uh, we are facing another very important uh, pillar, which is geopolitical pillar. And these are a range of different threats and risks which our countries are facing. And here, probably, when I'm saying our country, I'm not thinking and talking only about Latvia. I am putting myself into shoes of the European European Union. So we are very much in this dual situation, very intense domestic agenda, and unfortunately, 
very challenging and even in terms of military threats, a very aggressive international environment. So therefore, my question is how such multilateral framework consisting of US, EU, India, and Japan could serve the purpose of peace and stability for uh, our national interests, but also for international uh, reasons. So, Andy Pentland, probably now I will give floor to you, please. Great, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I would like to do something unusual, which is show one slide, if that's okay, uh, which I think says a great deal. Can you folks see this? The slide, yes. So, so. What this shows are the trade routes on which China dominates and the trade routes on which America dominates. And what you can see is that uh, there's something like 124 countries where China is the largest trade partner and only 56 where America is the largest. And if you add it in Europe, then you would get a picture that is a little more even. But I think this is the fundamentals of geopolitics. We talk about governance, we talk about uh, our military, but all of that is built on the economy and on trade. And a lot of the politics, the votes you see in the UN have to do with this diagram far more than any of those other uh, uh, issues. So um, I think that what we need to do is, as uh, Sherrod said, focus a little bit on the, leveraging our digital technology. China has moved very aggressively in producing what are called Web3 systems, new ways of managing trade, of managing money that are um, considerably better than anything that the West has to offer at the moment. And they are, of course, moving this into all of these countries where they dominate trade. And that is creating an uphill uh, or, or, or wind in our face for doing anything with most of the mid-income and low-income countries around the world. What I would love to see is I would love to see that uh, Japan and India and the US and Australia, but probably other countries too, like for instance, we just had a long discussion with the Prime Minister of Indonesia, uh, resolved to have uh, a, a particularly efficient digital infrastructure that makes it very attractive for other countries to trade with us. Uh, because I don't see this as a war. Uh, I think that's that some a uh, threat calling Russia, well, Russia is a little you know, crazy at the moment, of course. But um, they are competitors. They would like to see the world their way. And uh, to win in that competition, we have to make it attractive for the rest of the world to join us. And I think that these digital technologies and the sorts of ideas about governance that we have, which have to do with self-determination primarily, uh, are the sorts of things that can produce uh, a competitive block a competitive environment where we will be able to uh, maintain the sort of dominance that we've enjoyed in the last uh, half a century. I'll just end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your perspective. And indeed, uh, the slide which you showed and also points you made regarding uh, uh, economy and that economy becomes a very substantial part of those geopolitical games and geopolitical relations all around the world. And uh, uh, the emphasis on cooperation and collaboration uh, instead of uh, just competition or, or, or even and contesting each other is, is, is very fundamental for peace and stability. And now I would like to give floor to another professor from MIT, uh, Nazli Kochri. And you uh, devoted a lot of your work uh, to international law issues and how uh, international legal instruments could ensure peace and stability. So how do you see such a new framework of multilateralism 
mechanism like those four uh, economically, but also digitally very important partners, and also in terms of security important partners, what could be added value to such a framework? I would like, thank you. I, I would like to train the, the, no, the idiom a little bit, not by way of excluding what has been said earlier, not at all, but rather by way of highlighting what we may, an opportunity that we may be missing. So I would like to focus on the, the features of what a new multilateralism might be or would be or should be um, that has not been uh, highlighted so far. As you all know, there are many, many forms of multilateralism. Um, most of them, in fact, all of them, for, fall in the areas of trade, security, etc. as much has been said so far, uh, but they all have one common issue, which is um, somewhat broad sense of coordination and broad sense of, of, of collaboration. Um, even in areas that are specific, uh, military, etc. What is needed at this point, which is a perspective that the Boston Global Forum is trying to, to articulate, is to conceive of, an, of a multi, multilateralism that focuses on accelerating innovations so that we don't get stuck in the 20th century that we're trying to get out of, even though that we know we're in the first, uh, in 21st century. Um, we have a responsibility to future generations. Much of, of what has been said so far uh, deals with our own individual problems, which are very, very great. So when we think about um, pillars of strength or what the, what the um, proposed focus um, of um, the new multilateralism, multilateralism um, is, is to think about the, the, the premises on which we want to proceed. We want to proceed on common, common standards, on common value. Uh, we want to proceed for the future, for everyone's future, including our own, uh, highlight ability to innovate. And that is really quite important uh, because in many ways, our education system at all levels somewhat, um, a little bit behind the times. Um, and we also have to focus on innovation when we talk about private-public um, collaboration. In addition to this, we have to remember that societies and states are made of individuals. Innovation focus should be handled, highlighted to them as well. Um, so I, I would simplify maybe and say that the new innovative multilateralism is to appeal to challenges and the strength of, of, of civil societies, societies that the human beings that live in the societies. Um, and we begin to accelerate innovations that highlights uh, the inside transformations that have to take place on common ground, on common principles, and on common and common respects. So to, to conclude, I would say that the new dimensions of multilateralism or the new multilateralism uh, really is to strengthen reciprocity, um, not concentration, and to strengthen transformation, innovation, um, where the individual is becoming um, a core of, uh, of the dynamics. And the center is really has to be a mobilized civil society that pushes towards towards innovation. Uh, you might think that this is pie in the sky, but I really think that the source of capability and power comes from, from individuals and maybe it's the MIT bias. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nasli, very much. When I was um, listening to your intervention uh, and when you were referring to accelerating uh, innovations and then putting emphasis on the role of civil society and multilateralism, it seemed to me that probably innovation is needed in order to approach the concept of multilateralism itself, that probably is a fixed type of multilateralism which we have been mostly relying on is probably out of date and uh, we have to start to think about multilateralism as a flexible, open type of uh, different structures of relationship and definitely incorporating also civil society uh, in terms of uh, organized, let's say formal, but also informal civil society, thus only strengthening those tools which are available available for increasing peace and stability in, 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 in the world. So this would be probably one of recommendations which at one point you could discuss within uh, the Boston Global Forum. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to another member of, of Boston Global Forum, Jan Artuan, who is the co-founder of uh, the Boston Global Forum. And also CEO of this organization. And one of the peculiarities of the Boston Global Forum is that uh, this forum comes up with different innovative and interesting ideas, but but uh, they also work on recommendations, how to proceed, how to implement those concepts, ideas, which have been debated and, and, and discussed uh, during the elaboration of different documents, and also later presenting them on, on, on very high level, like, for instance, the United Nations and other bodies. When you were proposing this new framework for multilateralism, you definitely had already some ideas in mind, uh, what you would like to see as the end uh, product of uh, this multilateralism. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have already some at least draft recommendations which you would like to share uh, with, with, with colleagues uh, working on those issues? Tuan, please, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janeta. Uh, Thank you for your also contribution, great contribution for Boston Global Forum as a representative of Boston Global Forum in Latvia. And uh, we have wonderful leader of Boston Global Forum here. And uh, I would like to brief uh, systematically this initiative. The first, that is uh, uh, for concept, uh, you talk and we think, <coughs> have three things. We, uh, should uh, highlight about the concepts. The first, uh, now, we need to build, that is, pillars, that is, uh, not have yet. We build four pillars, very strong and very important for peace and security in the world. And uh, also, not only relation, we build that economic focus on Tech economy, tech economy very important. Decide who win in competition in the 21st century. And the US, India, EU, of course, and Japan, strong potential. So very wonderful, innovative, traditional. Now we need to make stronger and faster and lower cost, more effective, and smarter for the AI, digital edge. So that is the first concept for this uh, modular relation and uh, pillars. The second, we need to maintain, protect, and respect our norms, standards, and values. In Riga conference, every people talk already, and we need to maintain that. And the third, that is, uh, uh, we uh, try to apply and uh, extend not only four pillars, any country, respect standards, norms, values of us, 
we welcome, include China. If China respect our norms, standards, and values, we welcome. But uh, first, we think uh, India is a very important country with wonderful intellectual and uh, education. And there are a lot of India leaders in technology in the US and dean of business school in the US also. And the fundamentals, that is, that we need to fight fundamental. Fundamental, that is, uh, uh, our values and standards, norms in the edge of AI and digital. Uh, this is an initiative, uh, AI Society, we propose for the United Nations as the initiative, the United Nations Centennial Initiative was introduced that in this the book, the Remaking the World to What an Edge of Global Enlightenment. And uh, norms, standards, uh, <coughs> values here. And all, almost our speakers today is a distinguished contributor, <laughs> including you and our leaders here. And uh, yes, this is a fundamental for us to do. And uh, for economy, uh, our speakers talk very much about Dutch economy already. We don't talk more, but I highlight we need to build market, common market in pillars, really strong, really effective, and we can support each other as an alliance in economy, Dutch economy, to make we are strong and enough ability to compete and f win in this tie and this uh, battle, I will think that, battle in tech economy. And uh, I think the US now, the US government focused and do very much about that. And uh, for that, we need to have a community, yes very, very strong community. It not only leaders, not only government, but also for many private sector, public think tanks, uh, non-organization, non-profit organization, university, think, uh, leading with thinkers, every people. We need to collaborate to this special alliance to do. And uh, that is the economic. Uh, of course, uh, we have to protect for peace and security in our pillars, members, and our country. Based for this to win in this battle, we think this is uh, education, very important. We create new, that is, uh, innovation program for uh, the edge of global enlightenment. And uh, because uh, this time, we need to improve education uh, with new concept, new tools, new way to bring our people, every people, every person become an uh, innovator with internet, mobile, and platform very much. So we need to build this platform, this ecosystem for economy to make our citizen become innovator. That is a, a very important. And education will help and have to do that and must do that. And of course, we have a lot of challenge. Challenge inside the US, challenge inside EU, challenge inside Japan, challenge inside India. And of course, anything, any time we do, we need, uh, we face with challenge. And uh, consensus between four pillars. So uh, we have strategy to build and uh, have solution. Have, uh, we, we can uh, uh, brief thing about that. That means, as I talked, we need to build network and Boston Global Forum uh, contribute ideas, concept, form a network of 
distinguished thinker, leaders, and also every people, innovators can join. And also we <coughs> have a um, global alliance for digital governance. We need to coordinate many resources between our four countries, four pillars, four pillars. So a resort for pool to coordinate, coordinate to make more effective, stronger. Yeah, that is the, our ideas. And we propose a global alliance for digital governance from last year together with Club de Madrid Conference in 2021 September. That is our concept ideas. And uh, as you talk about <coughs> work, that means we action. And we, uh, that is a global alliance for digital governance, AIWS.net. That is the network. We start from that. We action with our concept. That is uh, our ideas. <coughs> Thank you very much. You put um, several very important emphasis uh, on uh, the idea of uh, new multilateral framework, uh, emphasizing the role of four pillars, so four strong economies which could share and which could uh, disseminate uh, wealth uh, to other countries which would be interested to be part of collaboration. You emphasize the role of digitalization, which definitely uh, falls, I think, into the list of priorities of all engaged parties. And again, looking at the EU digital agenda is one of big priorities of the European Union. And you see a lot of programs which have been put at place and, and, and countries are, are implementing that. And particularly, uh, one of the aims is to bridge a digital gap. And again, it, it falls into the idea of, of this new framework, as well as the role of uh, international norms and principles which should be uh, respected. And again, uh, looking at uh, those uh, four countries, it's, it's again uh, something what uh, our uh, players, I, I cannot call the EU as a country, but still as association of countries, is very much respecting uh, international norms. And then your point about inclusiveness, that uh, networks are always open for other networks. It's like network of, of networks. Uh, it's This idea is very relevant in, in, in uh, the age of digitalization. And also what you mentioned about education, it's also uh, a very important point because um, particularly those who, 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 who suffer from this digital gap or, or some uh, wealth disparities, for them education is absolutely important uh, important uh, resource and tool how to become included, how to become active partic participant in, in international affairs. So those points are, are, are extremely important. And if uh, I'm looking um, at the present state of affairs, that from the EU perspective, I think uh, mm, uh, the US is one of the major strategic partner in terms of of, of um, economy in terms of security. I could name several areas where indeed the strategic partnership is already there. Uh, Japan is extremely important partner and the recent uh, treaty, uh, relatively recent treaty, which was signed between Japan and, and the EU is also one of those existing already frameworks contributing uh, to economic growth and also uh, peace and stability. So with India, negotiations between India and the EU is uh, again renewed and taking place and there are a lot of hopes. But at the same time, despite this positive turn of events, which we could definitely enjoy and appreciate, and there are a lot of potential for that, still there is a question, uh, social contract, which you mentioned with regard to artificial intelligence, intelligence and digital governance. These are usually instruments which work within the uh, group of countries which share the same values. And, 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 and you mentioned common values, and Nasli mentioned uh, common values as very important starting point. 
but in order to uh, increase peace and stability uh, across the world, it's very important that uh, within those networks, uh, we could incorporate all, also those countries which are questioning the relevance of, of uh, global peace and global stability. Mm, and there are a lot of uh, actually domestic uh, different challenges which are not allowing probably to take full advantage of those existing networks. So my question is, and, and, and since we have very uh, very few minutes left. I would probably ask each of you, starting from the governor, what from your point of view are main challenges on the way to such new framework of multilateralism to peace and stability? And please do it in a couple of minutes because we are running out of time. So governor, please, what you would name challenges which should be addressed? We don't hear you. We don't hear you. Mike, we don't hear you. We don't hear you, Mike. Governor. Yes, we hear. We hear now. Sir, I expressed it, expressed at the beginning, which, which has been reflected in this very good discussion about Cold War-like rivalries at a time when we need the maximum amount of collaboration and participation. I recognize that there are certain pressures that are out there. I mean, one of the things that we've got to do is to work hard to, to eliminate those, those pressures and those rivalries as we build uh, more and more collaboration. But uh, we don't need another Cold War. And uh, that's the thing that I'm concerned about. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful group, a wonderful collaboration. Uh, we want to build it, grow it, and uh, make it something that is a force for peace in the world. And uh, that's what I hope we'll be working on as we implement some of these uh, very, very good ideas that have been reflected in our discussion this morning. Okay, thank you. Mr. Nakayama, what would what challenges you would name as uh, the most important ones? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, think more, you, if you think about the macro, you have to think about the micro also. So until I got married, I thought that if I got married, there would be one justice under one roof. But honestly speaking, there were two justices under the one roof. Uh, justice for the husband and justice for the wife. So in other words, after getting married, I came to understand the importance of trying to understand each other justices. So this uh, concept of image uh, fits with the bilateral relationship even for the international arena. And also the, the bilateral means it, it, it goes to uh, uh, multilateral also. And on the other hand, uh, I, I uh, you know, the, our region is a little bit different, uh, countering the traditional threat of one country called Russia with multiple country, the EU, is different from uh, countering the traditional threat of one country, Japan against the three countries of Russia, North Korea, and China. And uh, also, I uh, think that uh, currently I'm working as a venture partner in a private equity fund. Uh, but uh, looking at the movement of funds around the world, funds are moving from China to several countries in Asia. Uh, this is believed to be because China fears financial sanctions and is moving funds to countries that are not affected by financial sanctions from around the world. Uh, so why are you transferring funds? Uh, there are several ways to look at this, 
but there are those who speculate that the worry is related to Taiwan Strait and there is an element of war funding. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sharma, what would be your take on challenges? See, I think there are two issues that we need to resolve uh, you know, for a, for a good multilateral cooperation to happen. First, the nature of regulation has materially changed. It has gone and become techno-legal regulation. And uh, if you don't approach regulation in a new way, especially in the digital age with respect to data or money or even uh, with respect to privacy of people, uh, we will not be able to tackle uh, these multilateral challenges in an effective way. Now, this is not a new idea. Larry Lessig talks about it in 2006 in Code 2.0, but it has yet to become mainstream, and, and this is something that would be very important to tackle uh, in, a, in a meaningful way as we go forward. The second is that, you know, sitting from the vantage point of India, you know, we can see that some of the world is able to see all the state failures that take place. They ignore the market failures. And I'm usually referring to the US uh, there. And you go to Europe, they can only see market failures and they can't see state failures. And in India, we don't have the luxury of, uh, of being able to ignore either of the two failures. And we have to see market failures and state failures happening at the same time. So if we are crafting a new world, we have to start with this premise that both of these failures are taking place in almost every country that we are looking at. <laughs> so we have to make a new beginning and uh, we cannot extend the old ideas into the new world as if nothing materially has changed. No, things have materially changed. And therefore, these two ideas have to come into our lexicon and only then will we be able to make material progress on a multilateral basis as we go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, what kind of challenges you would name here? So well, I'd uh, reinforce what Sherrod said and Larry Lessig said, which is, is that we now have a techno-legal uh, world. And what we have to do is we have to be able to make it very easy and reliable and ethical for people to join in all sorts of things, uh, tracking down fraud, tracking down uh, corruption, being able to do trade, being able to be inclusive. And I think that the major challenge for uh, the Quad and for Europe uh, is to be able to bring other countries in the world along. We've uh, sort of let them wither with the current sort of inflation. They're suffering horribly. They've been suffering because there have been on sort of uneven playing grounds in this new techno-legal uh, uh, world. On paper, it sounds like all countries can compete, but that's not the reality. And what we need to do is be able to build systems for trade, for uh, justice that apply to everybody. And I'll just point out that that's what China is doing and doing it fairly successfully. Uh, despite some failures. And I don't mean to go to war with them, or to, com but we do have to compete. There is a marketplace of ideas. Now that marketplace of ideas is a techno-legal frameworks that we put forward for our partners, our partner countries, not just the ones that already think like us, but the ones in Latin America and Africa that are looking for a way forward. We have to be able to offer them a level playing field where they can feel good about joining with us. And that's really the core of the game to me. Thank you very much. And uh, Nosley, uh, what you would add to this list? Uh, I wouldn't take anything off the list, but I would add uh, a reminder that we tend to be reactive to challenges, uh, especially those that are related to the techno, um, digital, standard, legal uh, world. It's very important to start trying to understand uh, the dimensions of future changes that digitalization will bring and has brought, and to move from a perspective of reacting to what we see, to trying to anticipate and forge uh, our preferred sense of um, digital directions and uses. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And uh, uh, when I was listening what you were saying regarding those challenges, I was uh, really <laughs> nicely surprised about the diversity of them, because the topic of today's discussion, to a very large extent, was related to geopolitical landscape and how to find uh, multilateral solutions which could help us to serve through those numerous uh, uh, numerous challenges, and it looks that uh, the present situation and the present state of international relations require different tools. Uh, micro and macro level, which was mentioned here, we need macro tools sometimes for solving micro problems and micro solutions sometimes to approach those macro solutions. And innovations, innovations are produced by individuals, by groups, by companies. But also states can produce innovations, which again serves a purpose of peace and stability in the world. Another very important issue is that actually one of the rules of the game which we need in a very turbulent times is collaboration and the removal of different challenges which could, uh, could, could, could hinder diversity of co collaborations is uh, very much needed. But at the same time, we cannot approach the world from classically techno perspective, which you mentioned yourselves. The technologies provide opportunities, but the aim is the life of individual, the life of each human being in the world. And while there are countries which are attacking human lives of uh, children, uh, women, uh, human beings, we have to be ready to use a different type of solutions. And if multilateral is a tool which could help save lives of people, then actually we as academics, uh, politicians, experts have to be ready to collect them and to implement them either on national or on international level. So thank you very much for taking part in this discussion. Thank you to Anne to be here in Riga and being present and uh, sharing your views. And I hope that the Boston Global Hub Forum will be present in the next Riga conference in 2023. Thank you very much.